Well, as we continue on through our super series focus this summer here, uh, something we thought would be fun is to do an Ask Anything message uh, in the midst of our super summer. And uh, I learned a very important lesson over the past few weeks. Uh, when you invite people to ask anything, they will, literally anything. Uh, when, uh, a couple years ago, I guess now, maybe not even a couple years ago, uh, we taught through the entire book of 1 Corinthians. It was such a long series that we kind of broke up the uh, series among the passage breaks in those chapters. And uh, when we got to chapter 7, uh, we addressed the subjects of marriage and divorce and remarriage and sex. And so obviously those are subjects of high interest. And so we kind of clip along at kind of one chapter per week. We were going through that. And so when we got to chapter 7, I knew, hey, this is a lot of interest, a lot of questions about these subjects. I said, let's take two weeks and teach this so that we can be thorough. And then as we talk through it, we realize, hey, there's lots of things we didn't have time to get to still, even in two messages. And so let's uh, take one more week, and we'll let people submit questions that they have. And then we'll spend that third week in chapter 7 answering any questions that maybe we didn't get to in the text. Now, uh, it was a little bit of a, a rude awakening. It was a little uh, humbling. And here's why. I thought, man, we were so thorough in our teaching that, that maybe there's another question or two lingering out there that we can kind of you know, use that and answer those. So we allowed people to submit questions out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, when it was all said and done, uh, there were 58 questions submitted. And so what we thought would be one week of kind of ask anything to wrap up you know, that subject in chapter 7 ended up extending into three weeks. And uh, there were still questions we couldn't answer. So if some of you may remember, we put together a packet uh, over the next few weeks and said, hey, here's all the questions you asked that we didn't have time to get to. And uh, quite frankly, because the subject matter, uh, there were some of the questions we were embarrassed to answer publicly, all right? And so we put out a, a packet and uh, put that out there. So uh, we just were astounded at how many questions would come in. Well, uh, a few weeks ago, we started uh, submitting questions. And uh, let me just say in the words of the great prophet, Britney Spears, oops, we did it again, all right? Uh, planning for this, uh, early on there was a couple questions that came in. I thought, man, there's, there's not a lot of questions coming in, and, and here we're down to a couple weeks out, and so we may have to take some general questions that we've all answered lots of times in ministry and kind of use those as filler questions, but we let it run out and kept asking people to submit questions. And so uh, over the last few weeks, and we thought we'll address this in one Sunday as kind of a fun thing to do in Super Sump or something a little different, not how we normally teach, there were over 40 questions submitted. Uh, in the last few weeks. So I'm going to encourage you to get comfortable, if you would, all right? So here's what we're going to do. Uh, and some of them were so deep, uh, we couldn't even begin to answer them. Uh, honestly, for example, this was a real question that came out on one of the cards. Is a hot dog and or a burrito a sandwich? That's prophetic. Now, if you're here and you submit that question, congratulations. You, you made it to the sermon, all right? You submitted that and thought, they're never going to answer that. Yeah, so you made it. You're infamous now. So congratulations, all right? So, but we think of 40 questions so you can literally uh, ask anything. We, we can literally turn this into a multi-week series. And as a matter of fact, that's what we're going to do in 2022. We're just going to block off about three, four, five weeks and say, hey, you literally can ask anything. And we'll take time to roll through uh, that series um, in doing that. But for today, we just kind of had some time blocked off. And so we said, man, how are we going to get our arms around uh, 40 questions? Because here's what's going to happen. Either you're going to keep people here forever, which nobody likes, right? Or uh, you're just going to kind of answer everything in such a surface way that, quite frankly, you didn't offer any real help to anybody that has real kinds of questions. So here's, here's kind of how we game plan this. We picked the eight or nine questions that we thought, okay, um, these have the broadest appeal probably to the most amount of people. In other words, this is a question we've all fielded in ministry lots of times, so we no, there's a lot of questions about this. And then there was a kind of a section of questions that were, they weren't really what does the Bible say about fill in the blank. They were kind of church leadership questions of, hey, directional questions and how does pastoral care work at the campuses and how does this, you know, work at church. And so, um, so if you have those kinds of questions, that we got those, uh, they're not going to make it into that today. But if you'll email any of us, we'll be happy to answer those questions uh, to do that. Or if someone asks a question that was really really specific probably to just something they were interested in or a situation they were in that might not have had broad appeal to everyone. Uh, we didn't make that in there. But again, uh, you can submit those questions to any of our pastors, and we'll be happy to address those if, in fact, we didn't have time to get it. Now, here's a little disclaimer, all right? 
any time that I say you can submit or go to or talk to any of our pastors, what happens every time is this, everybody sends me all the questions, all right? So when I say you can go to any of our pastors, I literally mean any of our pastors, all right? And you can do that. So, so here's what we're going to do today. We're, we're going to get as far as we can today in the next hour and a half together, all right? So we're, gonna, we're just going to get through these. And I've listed out originally, we had listed out nine questions. But when we started building out thorough answers, I literally had to remove one of them off of the, the table. And so if you've got the version notes, you're going to see a question in there about the canon of Scripture, which is a fancy way of saying, hey, how did the Bible get formed and who had a decision in that and you know, who picked those books and those things. That's a great question. We've got a clear answer for that. Uh, but it's a longer answer to do that. So that may be in your version notes. We had to eliminate that. And then I don't even think we're going to get to all of the eight left that are here today. So we're going to come back and wrap it up either next week or maybe at the end of the summer we'll do a part two uh, in there. So I say that to say this. If you don't get your question answered today or next week and we wrap it up, you know, in a part two, and you've still got questions out there, email, uh, let me say this again, any of the pastors. And uh, we'll be happy to email uh, an answer to that question. Sometimes it takes us a little long time to get back, especially if it's a long detailed question, but we absolutely want to do that, okay? So here's where we're going to start today, and obviously because it's Ask Anything, we're going to kind of be all over the Bible, all right? So if you want to flip around with us, you're welcome to. If you just want to listen to me uh, go through some scripture, you're, you're welcome uh, to do that, okay? So we're going to start off in uh, Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 8. Those are two of the passages that we're going to look at today. And what we've done today is this. We've kind of taken the questions and grouped them by, by category, Okay, so in other words, there were several questions that came in under, you know, one heading and several questions that came in under a certain heading. So we're going to kind of group these into categories uh, and walk through them that way. And again, we'll just get as long as we can uh, in the next 30 minutes together. And whatever we don't get to, we'll get to part two the next week or uh, at the end of the summer, one or the other. All right. So here's the first kind of category of questions that that came in that people submitted. uh, And there were questions about salvation, questions about salvation. And basically there were uh, three, four, five questions, I can't remember now, but we're going to pick three of them that are uh, common questions that we've all dealt with uh, on uh, multiple occasions. And so the first question that we want to address that came in uh, about salvation was this, um, can you lose your salvation? So in other words, does the church hold to uh, what's known as eternal security, or would we hold to what's called um, conditional security? Okay, so let's just do a little quick survey. Um, how many of you grew up in a faith background? If you had any faith background, maybe you're like me and didn't grow up in church at all. But if you grew up in a faith background that taught that at some level or some kind of way, you could in fact lose your salvation or fall from grace, whatever terms that you may have been familiar or have heard before. How many of you grew up in a faith background that taught that at some point? You could lose your salvation. Yeah, just keep your hands up. All right, so everybody look around. These are people who went to false churches, all right? Can I just say that in a loving kind? No, I'm just kidding. So, so if you come from certain backgrounds, and I'm just going to name some backgrounds, not as a condemnation, but just as observation. So if you came from background like a, a Nazarene background or a Church of God background uh, or a Pentecostal background or, or charismatic background, some Methodist backgrounds, Wesleyan backgrounds, those kinds of things, then there's a chance at some point you heard taught what's called conditional security, that your salvation is only secure when certain conditions are met. And you have an active part in that. So God is doing his part and you're doing your part. And together, your salvation is secure. That's what's called conditional security. So they, other phrases you know, they might have uh, said were uh, you can fall from grace or those kinds of things. So can you lose your salvation? So we're going to look at two passages. Now here's the deal. I literally took this subject and taught for six weeks in a series years ago called Delivery Confirmation. So I'm going to take about six weeks worth of content and try and shrink it down to several minutes here, okay? And just kind of highlight real. But I want you to look at two key passages. These are not the only passages in the Bible that I think speak strongly to eternal security, that you cannot lose your salvation for those who are genuinely converted. Big caveat right there, all right? And uh, those passages are Romans 5. In Romans 8, now there's two key sections in Romans 8 we could look at. We could look at Romans 10. And uh, so I'm just going to read through those. uh, First one is Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Let's look at that one first. It says this, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, uh, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, 
But we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope, one of my favorite verses in the entire uh, New Testament. Now, hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Verse 6, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more than having now been justified, that's a key word, by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by our performance. Is that what it says? By his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So I'm just going to give some uh, kind of rapid fire, machine gun, bullet point observations on Romans chapter 5 to help build the case for eternal security. So in verse 1, what we learn is this, is faith is what justifies us, not our works. All right? Now, justification, um, some of you have heard justification taught like this. Justification means just as if I've never sinned, all right? So some of you probably heard that somewhere along the way. Uh, That is not what that means. It is not just as if I've never sinned. It's even more incredible than that. It's guilty, so you have sinned. It's guilty, but pardoned. That's what justification is. It's not just as if I've never sinned. It's, in fact, I have sinned. I am guilty, but through his grace, I've received his pardon. That's what justification is. Now, justification is a legal term. And what it means is I have a new legal standing before God. So imagine I'm in the court of heaven, and I'm standing before God, and he says, what do you have to say for yourself? And I say, nothing. And so, in fact, are you guilty? Yes, I am guilty. And so I stand before him legally condemned, all right? But through his grace that's offered to me, that's uh, accessed through faith in Jesus Christ, I'm still guilty, but instead of being condemned through the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm now pardoned. And so when a person receives Christ, they have a new legal standing before God. So Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, hey, you've been justified uh, before God. And so you're, now God looks at you through Jesus Christ and says, I'm going to treat you as if you were not guilty in the sense of penalty and wrath and those types of things. So faith is what accomplishes that, not our performance. All right, you got that? If you got that, say amen. All right. Uh, number two, in the second half of verse 1, Scripture also says, you are now no longer God's enemy. So once I experience justification, I'm now no longer the enemy of God. And because I'm no longer considered the enemy of God, I am now exempt from his wrath. That's what he's describing there. So once a person's received justification, they're no longer a candidate to receive God's wrath. Uh, Verse 1 also says that now I can approach God with confidence. Why? Because of what Christ has accomplished on my behalf, not because of my performance. Now I possess, verse 1 says, a sure and confident hope. So there's four points out of verse 1. Sounds like a sermon to me, right? And what is that hope on? It's my hope is on the finished work of Jesus Christ on my behalf, according to verse 1. Now, that's all just in verse 1. What else do we learn from Romans chapter 5? There's always going to be a struggle that's inherent in salvation. In verses 3 and 4 in Romans chapter 5, he says this, Not only do we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. So one of the things that people who hold to eternal security uh, or afraid that they can lose their salvation is when life gets hard, here's what they begin to wrestle with, this thought. Surely, if I was saved, life would be going smoother. Have you ever felt that way? Right? And if you say, no, I've never felt that way, listen, let me just announce this on on Q&A Sunday. No one likes you, all right? Because we've all felt that way. And it's built out of a bad theology. We're only going to get to one question, by the way. Just write that down, all right? It's built out of a bad theology that basically is is treating God like a cosmic vending machine that I'm going to put in love and obedience and devotion and consistency and tithes and service and, and all those things, and God should dispense to me a blessed life. Bad theology. 
And so what he's saying here in verses 3 and 4, he says, hey, listen, in this new, uh, now no longer condemned, justified state, you still will experience tribulations. As a matter of fact, what he's teaching here is that these tribulations are not evidence of the fact that you're not saved. He says they're indicators that Christ is at work in you through these trials, conforming you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And so spiritual struggles, tribulations, trials, whatever ver uh, verbiage you want to use there, it's all part of the evidence that Christ is at work in us doing his good work. Okay, so, so don't be freaked out thinking, I've lost my salvation because life is going hard. Sometimes that's the work of God in you through a trial. And a trial is not God moving away from you, it's God moving towards you. Now sometimes uh, hard times are the result of consequences. The great theologian John Wayne said, life is hard and it's even harder if you're stupid, right? And so sometimes it's the consequences of sinful and unwise decisions we've made. But if you can look and say, I've searched my heart, I've asked other people to speak into my life, I don't see any of those uh, you know, patterns of unrepentant sin, then in fact God is at work in you, conforming you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. There's an old illustration um, uh, uh, when they're refining silver. And so how they refine silver or even gold or any precious metal, I guess, is they heat it up. And when they heat it up, the impurities rise to the top. And that impurities is called dross. And what they do to get to pure gold or pure silver is they heat it up and heat it up and they scrape the dross off and they heat it up and heat it up and finally get to the place where over and over through that process uh, it becomes refined and it becomes pure. That's exactly what God is doing in the life of the believer through trials. That is a biblical theology of suffering in trials, okay? So struggle is a part of the process of uh, sanctification. So it's not, not just mean you've lost your salvation because life is getting hard. As a matter of fact, it's probably proof that Christ is at work uh, in you. Now, verse 6 also says this, that in salvation, God, not you, took the initiative. Now, some people get all you know, freaked out about this and you know, about, uh, Calvinism and free will and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to unravel all that mystery today in a few minutes, all right? But, but here's something I want you to understand. Go back to the Garden of Eden. And when Adam and Eve fell, who went looking for who? God was the pursuer in reconciliation. And so the fact that you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, God himself was the initiator of that. Now, people that believe in ultimate free will, you know, you chose God. He didn't come looking for you. You went looking for him. The Bible says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Now, there's a lot of debate. Can we respond? You know, is the response automatic? That's all kinds of debate about that. There should be no debate that in salvation, God is the initiator. So the whole thing got started not because of what you did, but because Christ was pursuing you. Verse 9 says this. Look at verse 9, Romans chapter 5. Verse 9 says this. Much more. Have, <laughs> this is my old Bible, and I can't even see it anymore. Verse 9 says, much more than having now been justified. So what's justification? Remember, a new legal standing before God. Right? Guilty but pardoned. Okay? So what's he saying in verse 9? He says, How, having now been justified by his blood. Who's doing the saving? Who changed our legal standing before God? It was Jesus Christ and his shed blood on our behalf. So God is the initiator in salvation, verse 6, and God is the executioner of salvation in verse 9. And so we see that it's the work of God, the work of Christ in us. And then also, uh, verse 10 says this. Th this is probably my favorite in this whole passage as it relates to eternal security. Verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God, how? Through the death of his Son, not our performance, through the death of his Son, and so much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved. Future tense. What he's saying is, the past work of justification that's been accomplished on your behalf has a future impact as well. And the future impact, he says, at the end of verse 10 says, we shall be saved. Future impact promise by his life. Listen, Salvation is the work of Christ by grace. You didn't do anything to earn it or keep it or sustain it in any point in time. And so it's solely the work of Christ. I just heard a phone ring. Someone has a Pentecostal friend calling them right now. That's not true. That's not true. So that's Romans chapter 5. Uh, let's go over to Romans chapter 8. Good. <laughs> We're not going to get through anything. Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8, look, there's two sections we could look at. So let's look at just uh, verses uh, 28 through 30 real quick here, right? Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. So 28 says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Many of us have heard that verse and a lot of bump stickers. Verse 29 says this, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so there's a pre-programmed process of salvation. He's saying foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and glorified. And what he's saying there uh, in this passage is simply this. Is that every single person that has been justified, it has been predestined that that person will in fact be conformed to the image of his son Jesus Christ. And he says every person whom he's justified, we'd call that getting saved, will be glorified. Now what's glorified? It's the future state when you're in heaven. When you finally are no longer battling your sin nature. And so what he's promising is here, hey, every single person that God has saved, every single one of them will make it to the finish line because of God's good work in us is what he's describing. He said it's a done deal. Every person he's justified will be glorified is what he says. Now, how many of you lose lots of things? Anybody lose stuff? Right? Like I lose, like I'm a professional. I can lose anything in a moment's notice. Here's the good news about salvation. God's never lost a person. And the good news is that everybody who runs to Jesus Christ will make it. That's what he's describing. We can look at Romans. We can look later in the book of Romans uh, in doing that. And so just for the sake of time, uh, we don't have time to get through all of those. I'm even leaving stuff here on the cutting room floor as we speak. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says this. He who begun a good work in us will bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. What's that? That's a promise that the work Christ started in us to conform us to the image of his son, it's going to happen for every single person that's received his son. John chapter 10 verses 28 through 30 says that everyone that belongs to Jesus cannot be taken away from him. Uh, Romans chapter 8, let's just look at verse 3 verses here at the end of Romans chapter 8 verses 35, 38, and 39. Romans chapter 8 verse 35 says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Skip down to verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's the categories he's hitting. And, and basically, uh, here's a little uh, spoiler alert. It hits everything. He's saying no physical thing can separate us from God's grip. No spiritual thing can separate us from God's grip. No present or future action can separate us from God's grip. No individual or created thing can separate us from God's grip. You know what you are? You're a created thing, created in the image of God. And so not even myself can separate myself from the grip of God. And so he's making the case clearly. Now, here's the question. How many of you have known people who at some time professed faith in Christ and you know, made a profession of faith at, you know, whatever, at some point in their life, and they just kind of fallen away from the faith? And, and I don't mean like, you know, the, like weeks or, you know, we haven't seen them since COVID. You know, I, I'm talking decades. They haven't darkened the door of the church in decades. Anybody know people like that? Yeah, we all do, right? So here's the question I get all the time. Like, I get all that. The person's really saved, pursuing Christ. Christ is at work in them. They're totally secure. I get all that. What about the people who fall away? What about those people? Well, let me speak to two verses. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 says this. They went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out uh, from us in order that it might be made manifest that they are truly not of us. What he's saying is there will be people who appear to be walking with the Lord. And at some point in time, they'll abandon the faith, giving evidence they weren't genuinely converted. So that manifests the fact that they weren't really a part of us. What 1 John chapter 2 is saying. We see that in the ministry of Jesus, John chapter 6. Lots of people following Jesus around. I mean, he's the hottest ticket in town. And, and it appears that they're followers of Jesus Christ because they're literally physically following him around. But when Jesus lays out the gauntlet in John chapter 6 and says, Hey, if you want to be my disciple, this is the cost you're going to have to pay. Verse 66 says, And from that day forward, many of them walked with him no more. We look at Acts chapter 8. Simon the magician thought he was converted. He's exposed later on. 
Matthew chapter 7 uh, speaks to the same reality. Verse 22 and 23, because here's the wrestle. People say, yeah, but, but I went to church with these people, and, and I watched them serve, and I served alongside of them. And you know, those, What about those people? The Bible speaks directly to those people. Matthew chapter 7, many will say to me on that day, not a few, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons, in your name perform many miracles, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So listen, you can be religiously active and still not be genuinely converted is what he's saying there. Now, we could look at key texts if we had time. We could look at problem texts, Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 10. We look at all this that we could talk about. What does the Bible mean when it says, whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God? We could wrestle through all of those, but but for the sake of time, we, we can't. And again, if you want the series uh, that we taught, I'm happy to send it to you. Let me say two things uh, really, really quickly. Number one, if you're ever going to understand this issue, number one, you have to understand the difference between positional righteousness and practical righteousness. Positional righteousness is who you are in Jesus Christ. It's justification. Practical righteousness is sanctification or also called personal holiness. Positional righteousness is what gets you to heaven. God looks at your life and says, it's not perfect, but my son was a perfect sacrifice on your behalf. That is the gospel. Now, every person who's experienced true positional righteousness, justification, that will show up in their life in sanctification or personal holiness. Do you know what you call a Christian who has no interest in personal holiness? A non-Christian. And so, number one, you've got to understand the difference between those two things. Your position in Christ is what gets you into heaven. Your practice in Christ is what proves that you belong to Christ, but it doesn't gain you entrance into heaven. So if you think, hey, you can get saved, you've got to keep up your deal, let me just ask you a question. How well do you have to perform? If you're holding this whole thing together... By your efforts, what Jesus started, even though Romans 5 says you're not, Romans 8 says you're not, Romans 10 says you're not, how well do you have to perform? Listen, if I believed that, I wouldn't lay my head down at night. Chuck Swindoll said, <laughs> said this. He said, if I didn't believe so strongly in eternal security, he said, I'd carry a gun with you everywhere I went. And every time someone got saved, he said, I'd shoot them dead on the spot because that's the only way we could be sure they got to heaven, right? So if you see me packing one Sunday, it's for your good, all right? I want you to get to heaven. Did I mention there's eight questions and we're like. Uh, Here's the second thing I want you to understand. So many people struggle with the assurance of salvation because they place too much emphasis on the experience of when they got saved. And I can't tell you how many times I've people say, well, I don't don't know if I knew enough. I don't know if I was sincere enough. I don't know if I really understood enough. I got saved at a young age. And they just scrutinize, scrutinize, scrutinize the experience over and over and over and over again. So let me just say this for the 1,000th time because I said this lots and lots of times, all right? The assurance of salvation comes from the evidence, not the experience. And so if you got made a profession of faith, you're seven, eight years old, you're like, I don't know if I fully understood it. I've had this... People ask me this lots of times. Some of my own kids have said, hey, what about this? Here's the question I would ask you. Have you repented of your sins now, and are you trusting Christ now, and are you following Jesus now? Yes, I am. That's salvation. So the assurance comes from the evidence, not the experience. My favorite quote on this is from John Piper. I love this. He says, I know that I'm saved because I witnessed Christ's ongoing work in me, not because I had this experience. And then listen to what he says. In the same way, I know that I'm alive physically, not because I have a birth certificate, but because I am, in fact, breathing. So if you've written your name when you got saved in your Bible, cross it out right now. I'm totally joking, all right? Totally joking. But here's the point he's making. The experience is not where the assurance lies. The assurance lies in the evidence that Christ is at work in me, willing me to obey when my natural inclination is to disobey. All right? So that's the evidence that leads to assurance. We literally may get to one question, all right? So this is good stuff, though. Amen? Like, it's hot. Get it while it's hot, all right? All right. So, doesn't James, uh, under the banner of salvation, doesn't James chapter 2, verse 24, conflict with the doctrine of salvation by faith alone? So let me read to you Romans chapter 5, verse 5, because these seem contradictory. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says this. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. 
right? So that seems to be clearly speaking of God's grace on our behalf. But then James chapter 2 comes along and says this. Uh, I'll start reading in verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Well, that seems contradictory. Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which it says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And that sounds like faith, right? He believed God. That's not a work. It's faith. And he was called to be the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So how do we, how do we reconcile what seems to be these uh, contradictory truths? And we could add there Romans chapter 9, whoever calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. No works. John 3, 16, no mention of works. Uh, we could talk about Ephesians 2, 8, 9 that speaks directly against works. Uh, for salvation. So how do we uh, reconcile these things? Well, it's not super hard. So here's the reality. Any time that Scripture contradicts Scripture, guess what? I've interpreted one of those wrong. Okay? So what's he talking about in James chapter 2 here? What he's saying is this. There is no such thing as a true, living, saving faith that is not verified by good works. It's not initiated. It's not sustained by good works. Uh, it's what we said earlier. There is no such thing as true justification that does not show up in real life sanctification. And so the idea that a person can make a profession of faith and have no appetite for the word of God, no participation in the house of God, no uh, fellowship with the people of God, and no concern with the holiness of God, but yet still to claim to be at peace with God is a foreign concept in the New Testament. You don't find that anywhere. Uh, Jesus didn't say, agree with me in the, in the Gospels. Jesus invited people over and over and over. Here was the invitation of Jesus in the Gospels. Follow me. And so this idea that you can be a follower of Jesus Christ but have no tangible track record of actually following him is foreign to the New Testament. That's American Christianity. It is not biblical Christianity. And so what's he saying here? He's saying, hey, if your life doesn't have the evidence of good works in your life, it's not genuine saving faith. It's not a faith that's alive. It's dead. It's not genuine is what he's describing there. Okay? So works don't uh, initiate or sustain salvation, but they are, in fact, are the evidence that a person has genuinely been converted. So those aren't contradictory truths. They're complementary truths when looking at those things. Again, I could teach a whole series on that, but we don't have time. All right? So uh, here, third question on salvation. What does Paul mean when he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians uh, chapter 2. Now, what he's saying here, it's not a command to work for your own salvation. Okay? Uh, what he's describing here, uh, he's saying, hey, we're not saved by our works, but we are saved unto good works. That's Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 10. And so what he's describing there, it's basically the same thing when he says uh, later, earlier in Philippians chapter 1, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. Working out our salvation is a lifelong process. It is something we keep on doing. And you've heard me say this lots of times. Grace is opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 says this. says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. What does that look like? It means working out your own salvation. Putting forth effort into the sanctification that happens through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. All right? So, uh, the second category is this, and this may be all we get to. Second category is this, uh, questions about death and heaven. Okay, so these questions came in under the category of death and heaven. Uh, here's one that I, I'm just, I, I can't even tell you how many times I've been asked this in 20 years of ministry. Is it wrong to be cremated? Okay, how many of you have heard at some point that cremation is not a good idea? Anybody ever heard that? Wow, lots of you, lots of you, Okay. So, um, so I've been asked this many, many times now. Here's some verses that seem to speak to cremation in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So some people argue and say, well, this, it's just speeding up the process there. Uh, first uh, Corinthians chapter 13. <laughs> and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have love, it profits me nothing. So some said that reference there. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And so that's similar to the process of cremation. Now, the first mention of cremation in the Bible is in 1 Samuel chapter 31, where Saul and his sons are burned, and their bones are burned too, all right? So let me read that to you. It says, but when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard that the Philistines had done to Saul... All the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons uh, 
from the wall of Beth Shem, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. Now, what had happened is the Philistines had cut off Saul's head, according to verse 9, and the bodies were probably mutilated, decaying, by the time that the Israelites retrieved the remains. So they thought the most dignified thing would be to burn that and then bury their bones. Now, so, so how do we wrestle with all this stuff? Well, one writer said this, and I would certainly uh, look at this as well. He says, it was probably considered more honorable to cremate the royal uh, uh, group here than to attempt to haul the mutilated, stinking bodies elsewhere for the usual Jewish burial ceremonies. All right? So clearly in the Old Testament, we see uh, times where it talks about bodies uh, being burned. Uh, but to be fair, burial was the standard practice of both the Old and the New Testament. So, so here's a little statistic. On 200 occasions in the Old Testament, burial is mentioned as the standard disposition of dead bodies. Okay? So over 200 times. So clearly, that's the pattern in Scripture. However, does that mean that was simply descriptive of what was practiced, or is that prescriptive, and therefore we're prohibited to participate in cremation? All right? So let me just clear this up really, really quickly. All right? There is no Scripture prohibiting cremation. None. Zero. None. Now, some Bible teachers that I deeply love and read and respect have argued that we should treat the body uh, with reverence. We don't have a disembodied faith, and so therefore burial is a way to care for even the body. But even those who argue that burial is preferred, they would say it is not required, and therefore cremation is not sinful. And so while the Bible doesn't uh, directly forbid cremation, it's, it's not a sin. Timothy George, his theologian, said this, He said, while the weight of Christian tradition clearly favors burial, the Bible nowhere explicitly condemns creation. Now, why have lots of you raised your hands and say, I've heard that before, it's wrong. Here's where that came from. That people who were taught about the rapture and the resurrection of the dead, to reunite with Christ and stand before the judgment seat of Christ, they they were taught that, that God can't put your bodies back together. Let me just say this deep theological statement. God can do whatever he wants. God is omnipotent, meaning he's all-powerful. And so if God at the beginning created man out of the dust of the ground, God can once again put man back together out of the dust of his remains. All right, so so God is not limited. And can we just be honest? I don't want to be graphic, but let's just be honest. That's just, just speeding up the process of what happens to everybody's physical remains. Right? So that, that, that idea that God can't be able to go back to people who have been in the grave for five, six, seven hundred years, that's exactly what God is going to do. God is not limited by those in the Roman Colosseum who were, bodies were torn apart by lions, and God is not limited by putting back to the bodies, resurrected bodies, of those who have gone on and have been cremated or they have, in fact, uh, disintegrated uh, from being buried for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. So all cremation does is accelerate the natural process of decomposition. So it's not a sin to be cremated. And, and here's why I want to, want to uh, lean in on that. I can't tell you, I can't describe to you how many times I've met with families who have deep grief and shame because they could not afford a traditional burial and they thought somehow they had let God and their loved one down. Listen, let's do away with false guilt once and for all over this issue. Let's let our position be consistent with Scripture, not church tradition. Can we say amen to that? Okay. Gosh, there's so much more to cover. I'm on question two. Not in foot. Um, so so can, I, can I just go over for just a little bit? And if you need to step out, for I'm going to answer one more question because it's so important. And, um, and I've been asked it so many times. And so I'm going to go over for a few. Is that okay with you guys? Totally rhetorical. I'm going to keep going anyway, so... All right, so, so, and, and you'll see why I want to get to this question. Uh, I literally can't tell you how many times I've, I've answered this. Do babies who die go to heaven? Uh, will we know our babies we've lost when we see them? Will they be grown? Okay, so let me just answer this, and we'll save the rest of it uh, for next week. Which, by the way, you want to come back, because there's a question here about beer, and I know that you want to hear our answer, right? So There really is. Yeah, amen. <laughs> and by the way, if you want to know the answer, you can't come back, just write it down, Michelob Light. That's just right there. No, Some of you just decide you're not, I'm not going back to that church. I'm not going back there. So. All right. So uh, do we believe that the, uh, the babies go to heaven when you die? We, we believe clearly the Bible teaches that babies go to heaven uh, when they die. 
And, and we don't believe that because it's sentimental and it's emotionally encouraged. We believe that because we think that's the way the weight of Scripture is. All right, so the Bible describes babies and young children as uh, innocent. Now, it does not mean they're, that they're not untainted by the fall. Uh, we all inherit sin from Adam, uh, Romans chapter 5. And so uh, the reality is the reason they die in the first place is because sin has affected all of us. Okay? And so by innocent, here's what we mean. Scripture means that babies have shown no willful rebel, uh, rebellion or unbelief. Romans chapter 1 talks about those who, who don't know God as suppressing the truth of God. An infant does not have the cognitive ability to suppress the unknown, in their minds, the unknown truth of God. There's no open act of rebellion. A child cannot assess in his own heart that his actions violate the law of God. Now, let me just say this because this kind of comes up as well. What about people who are mentally impaired? They would fall in the same category as well. I believe the deepest conviction I have that every single person who's mentally impaired, every single one of them will be with the Lord one day. Every single one, same, for the same reasons. So children aren't yet responsible moral agents. Romans chapter 5, verse 13 says this. Where there is no knowledge of the law, sin is not charged to anyone's account when there is no law. Now he's speaking about were the people before Mosaic law guilty or accountable to God. Now they weren't accountable to God for personal sins that were revealed in the law, but they were accountable to God that they know they had violated his moral law. Listen, there was no law in the garden, but guess what? God gave a moral decree and said, do not eat of the tree. And so when they violated that law, guilty before God. And so does a baby have a knowledge of the moral law of God that they're suppressing the truth of God? No, they do not. So they're accountable for the revelation that they, have, they know at that point, which is very, uh, very minimal. There's a passage in the Old Testament. You may be familiar with this. Uh, King David's infant son dies. Remember that in the Old Testament? And listen to what David writes. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? And listen to what David says. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. What's David saying? I will go to him. David's saying that baby is with the Lord. And God has not chosen to deliver him from death, but one day I'll be delivered from this body and I'll rejoin my baby in heaven. And so we see that clearly uh, teaching and modeling that principle in Scripture. And so uh, the New Testament indicates that um, our, identities, our identities remain uh, uncha uh, unchanged in heaven. Now, what, what does our glorified body look like? I, I'm, not, I'm not totally sure. I'm not totally sure. It's probably about six feet tall, about 200-ish. So I don't know. How old will we be? I've heard some people argue, well, we're all going to be 33 years old because that's how Christ was. Listen, the Bible doesn't say that's the problem with that. Can, can we just all agree, if the Bible doesn't clearly say something, we shouldn't hold that position. Can we agree with that? Right? But, but here's the reality. You and your child will have identifiable, distinct uh, identities. And I believe that you will know them in heaven. Uh, for, write this verse down, all right, and then we'll wrap up. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. So will we know people in heaven? Yes. Will the relationships be a little bit different? Marriage and all that kind of stuff. And what about remarriage and those kinds of things? Uh, that's actually the next question we're going to get to. But do I believe with deep conviction the scripture teaches that a child is innocent before God? There's no knowledge of the law that's charged to their account. They have no recognition of the moral law of God do we see the example of David saying hey my child's with the Lord and one day I'll go see him absolutely do so, so here's, here's the good news of the grace of God every single person in the room who's lost a child uh, post birth or pre birth or stillborn any of those things uh, one day you'll be reunited with your baby is that not good news not because of what they did but because of what Christ has done for all of us alright so uh, next week we'll get into what about marriage and remarriage in heaven and those kinds of things. Uh, we'll get into uh, how, do we, how do Christians handle social drinking. Uh, and then we'll talk about speaking in tongues. Actually, I'm going to model it. That's what's going to happen. So I'm going to be here for that. All right? So, so how do you wrap up a sermon like this? What's the challenge? Here, here's the challenge, and we'll pray, all right? And we'll get out of here. The challenge is this. Let's cast aside every tradition we've ever been taught. And let's solely base everything we believe on the authority and sufficiency of the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. Okay? The Southern Baptist Convention is not our guide for what we believe. Our church backgrounds and traditions is not a guide for what we believe. I'm holding high our, the guide for faith and practice at Liberty Heights Church. It's the Word of God. 
All right? So that's who we want to be. We want to be a Bible people. All right? So let's pray, and then we'll come and dismiss this out real quick. So, God, we're so grateful that um, you, you give us wisdom. God, you don't just save us and then leave us here to fend for ourselves. And while the Bible's not uh, exhaustive in every application, God, it is comprehensive. And so, God, we're grateful that you love us so much that not only do you call us to yourself, you offer guidance through the Word of God and through the Spirit of God. And so, God, help us to be people that hold high the Word of God. God, I pray for everybody in the room, me included, that no matter what tradition we've ever heard, that, God, we would submit everything in our lives under the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, that everything we would view in life would be through the lens of Scripture. So, God, we look to you for wisdom because we are desperate and needy people, and we're grateful that you grant it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.